All right, for this episode, I interviewed Elton Lammy. We were working on a musical project, the same project, for a few days. He was in Nashville. I've known him a couple years, met him at Music Ranch Montana. Um, He did a show up there, a tribute to Vince Gill. And, you know, you might see that, go, okay, so there's a guy that does tribute, he's a tribute artist. And it is easy to miss how talented some of these tribute artists are unless you actually go see them play. You might see it on the sign. Um, I know for me, I go, ah, you know, I don't know. I think I'd rather see Vince Gill. And then I go, well, I'm here. I'm at Music Ranch. I'm going to watch Elton Lammy. Whoa. Y'all, my jaw hit the ground because I forgot it was a Vince Gill tribute. To me, Elton Lammy just took over his voice. He didn't mean to. He's very humble. Um, he's That's actually why he's able to do so many different things. He's open-minded, humble. He's an entrepreneur. He's been he's done the Nashville Music Road thing. He's he's got history in music. He's been in bands as a drummer. He lives in a town with 75 people in Alberta, Canada. I mean, this guy he's got both feet planted firmly on the ground and he has made a living in the music business for decades. Really proud of Elton Lammy, really proud to know him. And uh, I can't wait for y'all to hear this episode. I'm running it on both podcast platforms that I have. I have Chasing That Neon Podcast. That's the name of a show I started on Apple, Spotify, or whatever platform you listen to. That is a podcast series where I interview musicians and session players. Usually that's had a little bit more production in the past, but I think I'm just going to put this one up on that platform as well. So if you're listening from Chasing That Neon Podcast... Y'all come over to On the Cusp and Off the Cuff. If you look that up with Adam Pope, that's me. Uh, you'll hear a lot of stories. And I I prefer the guest episodes. I think they're the best. And I'm hoping to do a lot more of those moving forward, especially after this episode with Elton Lammy. Also, a little shout out to our drummer, Asa Lane, who sat in and listened um, and was a part of the interview. So, all right. Hope y'all enjoy it. This is a long intro, but I'm really excited for it. Um, it's it's a it's a great episode if you can stick with it all the way to the end. Elton Lammy on the cusp, off the cuff with Elton Lammy. Just took a big old sip of swig. A swig, that's right. Of Diet Pepsi. I'm gonna set the mic right there. All right. I think that'll pick it up. Good. Yes. I look like we got something going on. Absolutely. So, Elton Lammy, you are from. Alberta? Is that where you came from? Alberta, Canada, which is Western Canada. It's the second most Western province of the nation. and uh, But born and raised in the first province to the West, which would be British Columbia. And then lived a great deal of time in my life in Ontario, which is Eastern Canada. So you're currently above Montana? Yep, right above Montana. How many hours if I drove from yeah. the border? Yeah, I can be in Montana in less than three hours. Oh, okay. No, that's that's awesome. It's not that's too not bad. bad. That's yeah. like from here to Memphis. We're in Nashville right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. We're not in Nashville. We're kind of outside of Nashville. In Portland, Tennessee, looking at fields. Um, that's where I live. So you live in a town with how many people? 75 people is on the population sign. So this week that I've been seeing you, it's 74. <laughs> What the, do they change the number? They go out and flip it, flip the number to 74. Just They don't want to throw anybody off. I love that, man. <laughs> what is it like? I've never lived in a town with 75 people. Do you feel like you know all 75? Uh, I think that you do see... I have to haul water for my house. You, so, hold, well, hold on. What now? Yeah, I have to drive... I drive uh, my old tour bus from... <laughs> Okay. From all my years of touring. Okay. So it's 30-some 30, 30 feet long, and that's hooked up to a water trailer that will take 500 gallons of water. That's the only vehicle I own that's big enough to haul around thousands of pounds of water. A tour bus? Yeah. So everybody in that town knows when I need water. <laughs> <laughs> Here he comes! <laughs> Oh my gosh! So yeah, every uh, probably once every three weeks, 
either my wife or I. Will, Your wife will crank the tour bus? She told me she went and got water yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. And she'll pull up to the water station, and that's kind of where you see the town. You know, there's not much else going on in town other than the water and, and the where you take your garbage. The dump? The dump. Do you have a restaurant? No, sir. Not anymore. No. Wow. It's about to rain, and there's thunder, but that's okay. It's the, I, I like the fact that I've been in Tennessee now for a few days, and uh, there's no sun, so that's interesting. I haven't seen any sunshine yet. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been, been a weird It's been cloudy weekend. and rainy every day, but I love the green... Uh, where I live, it's very semi-desert climate. They're begging for rain all the time. Where well, I it must be you're driving to get water. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm mighty. I've got water out oozing everywhere. i got water you coming got water, through my ceiling. Yes, yes. Dripping. <laughs> <laughs> Don't think I wasn't trying to think of how to take that home with me. <laughs> that little orange bucket. I was thinking, yeah. how can I get that on an airplane? That's a little bit of water. There's water in there. Absolutely. <laughs> Man, I'll tell you what. i we take for granted having a well on yeah. our property, so, so yeah. you, you don't have access. To you'd water. have to drill h- hundreds of feet down, and you'd have to purify that water to such an extent because where we live is just not a good quality, full wow. of alkalines, and and so yeah, not uh, not the ideal. But we're happy. We get to it gets us out of the house, and we get to drive down and see the town folk, like we're a circus act. Well. I'm actually going to pick this thing up because I don't know if it's going to get raining crazy. I'm going to do the old interview. Hold the mic. I'll hold it here by my mouth. And then there's Elton over there. (laughs) See, y'all hear how audio works. Yeah, there he is, loud and clear. Yeah. So, all right. I I just, for my own personal, like how long have you lived where you live now and been hauling water? Only for the last year. It's, It's been one calendar year. One year. Since my wife and I bought this farm and acreage. So uh, we got 20 acres that we, we have, and then we bought that off of a farmer that he owns 6,000 acres. So, Okay, so first of all, it's amazing. Are they called acres there? Yeah. They're not ki- kilo something? No, no. I know it sounds like well, a dumb well, question. No, no, I get it. With metric and imperial is... Right. Yeah, yeah. I wonder why that's the same. But I, I think because the, the old school... It's kind of like when you say how tall you are, the old school lingo is still in imperial language. So you say you're six feet tall. Oh, man, I never thought of this. Whereas now, you know, in, in, in European countries and in Canada, they're, they're trying to get everyone to use metric terminology. So you would say how many centimeters you are. So in Europe, I would not be six feet. I no, would be... you'd be a certain amount of centimeters. But or in, meters. In Canada, what would I be? Six feet? Meters. You'd be six feet. For real? Yeah. Hold on. You just it, said I'd be six feet. What, but it depends on how old you are. The new generation, they're still trying to get kids to say, okay, he's 1.6 meters tall. Whoa. But it's not really working because there's too many of us people that grew up with pounds and inches and feet and miles, Right. But when you drive your automobile, everything's in kilometers. Man, that's got to be just confusing. It is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome to Canada. Well, thank you, because first of all, thanks for talking about the differences, because I think a lot of people that listen to this would be, well, all six of them live in Tennessee, so. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, (laughs) you're educating the masses. Yes. Yeah. all right, so Elton, I first met you at Music Ranch in Montana, and I remember the show. It was a tribute to Vince Gill's music. Yeah. And I had been there for several weeks at this point. I'd seen a songwriter festival with a lot of big name people. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd been seeing, as a matter of fact, over the years at Music Ranch, I've been a part of shows. I've seen a lot of shows. I've seen. Neil McCoy, yeah, uh, some really cool '90s country artists. Yeah, when you showed up, there were more people to see your show than had seen any of these other shows I'm talking about. <laughs> what even the, like the shows I've been a part of. Yeah, and then you delivered. You went out there, and you just 
it, so casually, your personality is like kind of come out casually, and then you just shook the rafters with your amazing voice. And I'm not, you know, trying to over over compliment. This is my takeaway. I'm out there. That's what I'm feeling and thinking. Sure. Yeah. And um, ever since then, I've been an absolute fan, and I see all the different shows you do. You so explain your journey because then I found out you had a record deal in the '90s. And in Nashville, and this just this amazing life of music, and so let's. That's where I saw you. Let's start at the beginning, and because sure. I'm chronological, and let's just go. Do you start? You yeah. start with whatever you want to talk about. Well, so I uh, yeah I grew up in British Columbia, and I would say that my my first influence for music would have been my mom. My mom was in a band even before I was born. She was touring around the interior of British Columbia, singing in wow. bands. Um, so she was a good old country singer. Country singer. Yeah. Wow. And uh, I think having children is probably what stopped her her momentum. You know, I'm not sure she was ever going to pursue it further than just being a weekend band. Right. But uh, having my brother and I as young children, that kind of... But it didn't stop the music from being in the household. So the record players, the eight tracks, I'm not sure if you've ever... I have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I've got a few. I've never actually played one though. I yeah, don't have we, a player. We lived on that stuff. We it was it was all day. We'd be listening to the classics: Hank Williams, Charlie Pride, uh, Conway Twitty, Loretta Lynn, Tammy Wynette, George Jones. Those are the people that our household grew up on. And um, but as a, as a youth, my brother was the singer, and I was just the uh, a side man. Wow. So whatever instruments we had in the home, uh, like a, an old organ or a guitar or whatever, I would try and figure out how to play it in order to accompany my brother, who's the vocalist. Right. It's ironic that I would end up becoming a vocalist as a career, and my brother ended up building houses for a living. But that's the way, as kids, he was the singer. Yeah. Um, and he Was he older than you? Yeah, two years older. Okay. Two years older. And then... Uh, at age 11 is when I decided that I wanted to learn an instrument for real, like not just tinkering on it at home. And drums was something that intrigued me as a young boy. I think lots of boys like hitting things. Absolutely. And so I started taking private lessons and learning how to read music and, and play drums for real. And then th all throughout high school, high school for us in British Columbia starts in grade 8, in high school we could join the band and then I started playing jazz uh, jazz drums in, in jazz trios and combos and, and full ensembles so I was a jazz drummer Wow! and then I started not getting bored of drums but I wanted to also learn how to play melodies and so I started taking lessons in saxophone and uh, woodwind instruments and yeah. then but I'll, I'll be honest, like if, if you went back to my hometown where I grew up in, which we have done on tour, we've, we've done shows. When I take my band, who's not from BC, back to where I'm from, and they meet all of the people that I grew up with, those people are honest and say Elton wasn't exceptional in music. I wasn't. But I was exceptional at sports. Really? <laughs> So I was one of those kids who grew up on every sports team, and and I, and I was, you know, my dad has kept all the trophies and medals and everything. I was an awarded athlete, but not really an awarded musician. Man. So it's so a strange... What all sports were you killing it in? Uh, I was a good hockey player, football player, uh, wow. basketball player. Like, I'm, I'm not that tall. I won't go into how many centimeters. <laughs> well, they, they, you sound very tall on the podcast. That's, that, let's just go with that. Yeah. Let's, that's what I like about radio <laughs> and not television. So I was, I was, I was destined to make a living in something to do with athletics. Mm. If you would have asked anybody from ages five to seventeen, what Elton would do, it's not that I would become a professional athlete. But I did play alongside athletes on their teams that did 
end up in the NHL or they ended up as a wow. professional football player. Like I was at a pretty good level as an athlete, but by the time I was 17, that's when I started exploring music. And then then my my lane changed. Do you think was there any part of you that the music part of what you do was automatically you understood the team aspect of it with the band. You already had that because so many musicians that have never experienced any sports. Yeah. Not all of them, but there's some they show up, they don't it takes a while for the concept of team to get embedded in, in, in their minds and you as a guy who played sports, did you bring that did you notice that that was a part of your thinking already or, or uh, is this I a goofy question? Think, I definitely think that that's, that's a logical part of the transformation because even in, in sports, there's a team aspect, but then you also have to think about what strengths and weaknesses are yes. in a team concept. Some guys or girls are good at this part of the, the sport, but they're not so good at that part of the sport. Right. There's also getting along with an ensemble of people that have different personalities and different characteristics. That's the same as working in music, where you've got yeah. you got you got people who are exceptional at this and maybe not so exceptional at that, and you figure out what works in a team environment. So, I, and, and there's a competitive aspect to it. Yeah, the, the idea, you know, we we were raised that that participation is fun, but winning <laughs> is better. way better. Yeah, for sure. So in in music. In order to accomplish almost anything in music, it's competitive. Mm. And so uh, I think that a lot of those lessons that I would have learned for all those years as a youth were somewhat preparing me for a career in in one of the craziest industries you can get into. Yeah, absolutely. And you're still doing it, which we'll talk about all the different ways you've been able to make that happen. And I look up to that. Mm. And so that's why I wanted to talk to you. Sure. So, um, all right. So you're 17, and you transition to music. Was that a conscious decision, or did, was it just opportunities opened up and you just went for it? And then you found yourself doing that all the time. I know it sounds like a cliche because I've heard a, a lot of artists talk about this, but I wanted to create my own songs, and I couldn't do that as a drummer or as a saxophone player. Yeah, there was no way for me really to create. So I thought, I've, I've got to go back and, and recapture this guitar thing. So I sat down with my uncle and I got him to show me some chords on the guitar. And then at least I could, I could start to experiment with writing melodies, writing lyrics. And I'm not saying that anything that I wrote when I was in my late teens or even into my 20s was good material, but at least it was giving me the foundation of mm. going from the back of the stage as a side musician to all of a sudden being at the front of the stage. So right. w when I was 16, I was playing drums in a rock band that my brother was the lead singer. And I never sang at all. Yeah. And then, then by the time I was 17, I thought, I'm, go I'm gonna enter myself into some of these contests that I see looking for, you know, to, to sing. And that, that started to work. Like all of a sudden, I was starting to find my own voice and my own uh, identity at the yeah. front of the stage instead of at the back yeah um, and and that's more thrilling yeah yeah it's, I didn't know that but <laughs> I, it, that's that's an excitement that uh, and I was a fan of you know you and I've talked before I was a fan of Elvis and and all those country stars that that I had grown up listening to and so if you start to emulate the way that they would sing songs and and I think it takes a while to find your own sound and your own voice but I knew that was going to come at some point yeah so I, I remember I mean I was in this is going to sound silly in the late 90s early 2000s that was my high school was 2000s yeah. early 2000s and I remember there were homeschool teams that I could be a part of and because I was the homeschool kid. Okay. I don't know if I ever told you that. So no, I'm a homeschool kid during this time. And I'm in North Carolina, and I remember getting on a couple teams, and I would work obsessively at basketball. 
Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you know, we have this in common where I wanted to play sports. Yeah. And basketball was the only thing I thought about. I did pick up a guitar at 15, 16 years old, but from age 11, 12, 13, 14, all I did was play basketball yeah. and woodshed on that. And so by the time I'm in that high school age, I'm on these teams that, you know, some real, I mean, I was a nerd, but there's some real dweebs out there yeah. that on the homeschool world that are getting on the basketball team, you know, <laughs> they're, they're dribbling the ball off their foot, you know, yeah. I did it too, but these guys were goofy. And so yeah. I was on these teams where I just felt like, I'm just going to, I'm going to take over. I'm going to grab the ball and I'm going to go for it. And I remember the excitement from the crowd. So like hitting a shot, hitting a three or whatever, or silencing a crowd with free throws. Sure. When you're against the other team. And being a homeschooler, I had a chip on my shoulder. Like we're playing this, these teams that were like, um, you know, private schools and they had really good players. Sure. And I remember we always lost. Yeah. But I remember the moments of silencing the crowd or whatever. It gave me this thrill that years later I would find when I could excite a crowd with a guitar. Yeah. Or with not my guitar playing, but with just entertainment. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so did that Did that translate over? Was it like the. Because the, you just said the word thrilled. It was more thrilling to be up front singing. Yeah. And were you chasing that when you were doing sports too? That thrill was there something you were chasing there? I don't know if 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 it would be as much the the thrill of of audience reaction as much as it's the thrill of of bettering myself all the time. Right. So if if I would score, because I even though I was not tall in stature, I would be the point guard that would always bring the ball up and distribute it. And 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 execute plays that were on the basketball court. Yeah. So and, and I was also that kid that would go to basketball camps in the off school season. Yeah. So I would go to hockey schools and I would go to basketball schools, so that I'd be better by the time the school team started in September. Yeah. I'd be better than when I left off in June. So for me, it was more a self competitiveness. I love that. Yeah. And I think that that has revealed itself throughout my entire career in music as yeah. well like being better at, as a musician and being better as a singer was my own goal that was driven mm. so I, I'm always fascinated with the psychology behind why people do things so alright so fast forward you're winning competitions now yeah and my late teens I started winning these singing contests and it was it was crazy I remember the first contest that I ever went in that was a real sponsored contest I won some cash and a 26 inch color television but back then Adam a 26 inch TV was a tube television so it's as big as the table that we're that we're sitting at because it's it's a big size but it's full of all the tubes and electronics and vacuum this and that you know yeah. so that was a big deal to me and I remember giving it to somebody like a lot of these prizes that I had won within two years I gave away. I get. I won a trip to Hawaii, in a in a singing what? contest, and I gave that away. Uh, Why? I didn't think I would ever be able to make it where I could go. Like it just didn't. It it wasn't something. That, I'm a small town guy. I never thought I'd be able to. Yeah. To to go to Hawaii, right? In hindsight, I wish I would have because that's <laughs> <laughs> that's a heck of a thing to give away. That's probably the only thing I would have really enjoyed to do, but. Uh, I ended up winning a, a lot of cash, like because a lot of these contests they would be. So I was in British Columbia, but then I would notice that they would have the Canadian country music singing contest would be going on back east in Ontario, where the big population is. But the first prize would be, you know, one of them would be twenty five hundred dollars, one of them would be four thousand dollars, one of them would be fifteen hundred dollars. So I said at the time, I'm going to go to Ontario and enter all of these in the summer. Yeah. And, and who knows? And I ended up winning all of them. And then the next year, I noticed that there was other contests that I could add to that. So it was almost like a part-time job that when school would finish, I would travel and go do these singing contests that are not anywhere near where I live. But I'd come home with ten grand. Wow. So as a teenager, you're like, this is a pretty good gig I got going on here. But then, 
after a few years of winning, they they all say you can't go in it anymore. Like it's not. Yeah. But we'll get you to be a judge. Is what they would say. So then I would still go get paid, and I would judge the contest for that week, and then the next week I'd go judge another contest, and it's much like other industries like cattle you know entering your your animals in 4-H clubs or or whatever or dance competitions or violin competitions it's the same kind of thing there's a little cult that f- that travels around in their campers from week to week to yeah. week to week and i had figured out a way to make to make some money doing it i i'd, I'd make more money doing that than i would working at a at a corner store yeah uh and then I won a pretty big contest in Toronto, and at the end of the contest, there was uh, a couple guys wanted to talk to me backstage, and one was a guy from a rock band called Triumph, which I'm hoping at least four of your listeners have heard of the band <laughs> Triumph. Well, <laughs> they were a pretty, yeah, out of the, out of the four, maybe one has. They were uh, they were kind of like Rush because they were a three piece band, and they they were a they were doing stadium shows with all the big rock bands in America. So they were a big deal. Dang. And this was the drummer who happened to own a recording studio. Do you mind saying what year, era, this is? Yeah, well, this would have been 1989, 1990. Okay, all right. Yeah, so give it gives the so audience context. perspective. But yeah, 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 yeah. So 89, 90, around there, and so I'm backstage talking with a guy who owns the recording studio who I know him I've he's a drummer so I've been watching him my whole life he's kind of a legend yeah and then simultaneous to that there's a record executive who has a record label in Nashville he's wanting to talk to me so he's saying you've been on the radar for the last year all over Canada that that you're kind of on the rise as a country male singer and uh, what are your thoughts on us getting together and talking about doing some stuff? So that's kind of where it started yeah. as a career choice is I was going to get some recording time for nothing. Nice. Like this was a major recording studio in Toronto where, yeah. where, where major bands were recording even from America. And, and at the same time, I've got a label who's saying, why don't you come see me in Nashville? Yeah. So that kind of is what what started my early 90s. So all these competitions, are you winning them with country music or just a variety? Yeah, I remember winning, you know, I was... I started really doing well with with Ricky Van Shelton songs, Vince Gill songs, um, Diamond Rio songs, like especially the material that had height in the vocal. Uh Uh-huh. Because for some reason I had... Height in in my vocal, just not on my body, <laughs> but I had height in my vocal range. I could sing high, and uh, that that wasn't as common. Like you think of '89, that's when all those Alan Jackson came out, and Clint Black came out, right? And Garth, and uh, like there's a lot of guys that came out the hat the hat generation, I guess you'd say, and they were more traditional sounding. But then this guy named Vince Gill. Mm. Who sang like a tenor? He he almost he jokes that he he's got a big house because he sings like a girl. <laughs> That's one of his jokes. Yeah, he was different, and he is the only artist that I ever, when I heard him sing it, it literally stopped me in my tracks, and I'd get tears in my eyes. Wow! So uh, it's ironic that all these years later I'd meet you because of a Vince Gill show that I did. That is amazing, and you you did his music in a way that was super cool because you weren't imitating Vince. Right. You were doing his songs, but you sounded like like if I bought an Elton album yeah. singing Vince Gill, yeah. it was it stands on its own as different and and yet it's I I'm I lose track. I I'm, I'm not even thinking about Vince when I'm watching you sing those songs, which is what you really I mean is that what you you're not even really going for that. You're just going out you're you're paying tribute to Vince. People pay to see in a guy sing songs about Vince. Mm-hmm. We're jumping way ahead, but I want to say, how do you feel when I say I forgot about Vince? Does that 
how does that make? I mean, is that that's not what you're 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 yeah. a pretty humble guy, so I don't know what you're going for in those kinds of concerts. I think the only I mean I if I'm doing a tribute concert to a guy like Vince, I'm still doing it as me. Yeah, uh, I'm not I'm not intentionally trying to exemplify all of the characteristics of his performance. It's just I want to perform it the way that it moves me. Yeah. The only, I guess I'm lucky, is that I get to sing all of his material in his key. <laughs> it's amazing. Which is not normal, because he, he, he's a high singer. Right. So I think that's what just kind of gives me a smaller edge on other people who might sing the songs of Vince Gill. Mm-hmm. Uh, probably in this discussion, as we move on, we'll learn about some vocal training that I ended up receiving in my career oh, cool. that probably makes it harder for me to sound like anybody other than myself. I got you. Yeah. Um, but I still get to sing Vince tunes the way that, that I think they should be. You know, he's got a lot of passion and a lot of emotion, and, and I think if I can do that, then... I'm I'm hopefully doing a decent job. Well, for sure. I mean, it was moving to me, and I'm a huge Vince Gill fan, and so I was interested to see what it was like, and I, I thought it was amazing. Um, I know that even, you know, when I get a Vince Gill request, mm -hmm. I'm always my first question is, "Have you been listening to me?" <laughs> so, that's like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> You're like a baritone guy. You got to be kidding me. And then the second thing is, okay give me one more last chance in a you know i'm dropping it way down so um so i i can appreciate if somebody's actually doing those songs in the real key um so real quick you were talking about all this lead singing and winning all these contests is your brother like what do you what's he saying to you are you, are you was there a transition where he's like dude good for you or is he like you gotta be kidding me right now there was a very short time period when I had moved to Ontario, where we actually played in a band together. Wow. A, a country band that, that we had kind of put together, and, and we had a different drummer, and we, we were more like a diamond reel where everybody in the band could be a singer on their own, or like the Eagles. Like, yeah. That seems to be a dying craft, yeah. where everybody in the band can sing. But... I remember where we played. I won't even mention the city because I don't want to be derogatory. But back in those days, if you were a country band doing any road shows, quite often the accommodations weren't weren't that great. Like I'm I'm a little bit older than than you guys, but back then if you'd play at a hotel for five nights or six nights, you slept upstairs. And oh wow. And when my brother saw the accommodations, he literally spent all his wages to go spend in a better hotel. Wow. So that was the end of him being a, a, a musician <laughs> on the road. Yeah. And he said, I'll just go back to swinging a hammer because that's what he was building houses. And so it was a short, a short run that we had in a band together. Um, but he's, a, he's more like you, to be honest, as a traditional sounding country singer I'm I'm not traditional sounding at all but you are and he is it's kind of like his influences were Lefty Frizzell and Merle Haggard and right. Alan Jackson whereas my influences were these guys that sang high uh -huh. high voices and, and not as traditional baritonal country cry in your in your bourbon yeah thing right so it was a nice contrast, him and I, but yeah. as a traditional country singer, I can still say to this day, he's much better than me. Oh, I, man, I don't know. Oh, yeah, all I mean, I, I don't know. He may, I'm sure he's great, but I just, I know, yeah. Well, we'll move off of that. You're just a <laughs> humble guy. So, all right, so back to your, it's 19, <laughs> the 90s are starting. Early 90s. Early 90s, which, that's the era of which I'm becoming aware of what's on radio at, yeah. in my childhood, and it just, the greatest radio yeah. era for country music for sure yeah that was the era and and to be honest with you I think that was the best era for a lot of reasons one of them is the quality of music that was the artists were fantastic yeah but also it was the right size 
like the size of popularity of country music was still a niche genre. Okay. It wasn't massive global popular music. Nowadays, it's a massive global popular genre, yeah. which means it's too big and it's too watered down and there's no talent. But at that wow. time, when you have this nice little niche, it's like jazz or it's like uh, world Americana music. When it's nice and small and manageable, then most of the artists that are in that genre belong there. They're not placed there by a record executive. I got gotcha. It's because their heart and soul is in Americana music. Yeah. Right? So a guy like Jim Lauderdale, you know, who I'm a fan of Jim Lauderdale. Well, yeah. Jim, Jim Lauderdale, he's had some hits in country music, but he's really an Americana artist. That's his thing. And that's where he wants to belong yeah. because it's a tiny little piece of the pie. And the fans are real fans. Yeah. Yeah. They buy the music. They go to the concerts. They buy the T-shirt. They buy the CD. Right. When you're a massive genre, that's why pop music, there's no staying power in pop music. Every week it's a new pop star. Mm -hmm. Another young, beautiful pop star. Country music's becoming the same thing. Every week it's a new young... And, and it becomes homogenized because they keep throwing all these people into the same bucket. And wow. the fans aren't real country music fans. Right. They say they are. Yeah. And they show up with... The, they'll go buy their cardboard cowboy hat and their cowboy boots and they'll show up with 18,000 people at a stadium. But they don't know anything about country music or the roots or the influences of the artist that they're watching. Yeah. In fact, the artist that they're watching might not even know no. the roots of... Like, they, they just became popular on TikTok or whatever, right? right? So, it is... The 90s was a great era because everything was the right amount. Mm. And that's just my own outside I've never heard it put like that. That's really interesting. Yeah. Hey, by the way, Asa Lane is here. He's... He's the drummer that we've been playing with all weekend. I've known Asa over ten years, friends. He's he's sitting in on this. He doesn't. He's very shy. He's, he's a very 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 quiet shy man. But no, I, can, can you say hi to the folks, Asa? Hello, say, folks. Hello, folks. Yeah, Asa is a good man, and he's here, and he's he's like me. We're getting educated here by Mr. Elton Lammy um, on this. That's a really cool perspective, man. I've never heard it put like that. Yeah, I. I that's just kind of the way I felt going through it. Um, but as as I entered that industry, so I came came to Nashville in, in the early '90s to um, put together a, a record deal and, and record down here. And for me, it was thrilling because all of a sudden I was getting to record not with my own money, first of all, which was great, <clears throat> but I was recording with people that I knew. I saw their names on all the jackets of the the records that I had bought. You know, I'm getting to play with guys that played on George, George Strait's records and guys that played mm -hmm. on Waylon Jennings' records and uh, Garth Brooks's records. And, and I'm like, like this is, life couldn't be better for me. Yeah. I was just on top of the world. And, and I probably, at that moment in time, I should have had an older person who cared enough about me to, to grab me and shake me and say, just, you know, don't lose yourself in your head this is still a job and I did kind of lose perspective of what was going on I thought okay well I did so well in Canada it only makes sense that I'm going to conquer Nashville yeah and you know I remember one of the nights I was down here recording and then I went to see a Conway show that night and I was a huge fan. John Huey was still playing steel guitar for him. Wow. Buttermilk and, John. And, and Porkchop was still playing drums. And so there was a bunch of people that I already expected I would be thrilled to see. But it was one of those nights where they wanted to showcase everybody involved with the tour. So the guy who was running front of house, he would come down and sing a song. <laughs> And what? then the guy that was running Spotlight would come down, <laughs> come down the chassis, come down the rig, and, <laughs> and he would go up on the stage and sing. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that these guys blew me out of the water. I couldn't believe how everybody I was running into in Nashville, every waiter, every guy that was parking a car, was there for the same reason I was. And it, it kind of opened my eyes like, holy man, like there's a lot of great singers here. 
Yeah. That they're about three years ahead of me. And and I didn't know that there's there's a protocol in Nashville that you kind of have to... You're not just going to drive into Nashville and somebody says, Hey, man, you're a good singer. You're one of the best singers in Canada. Let's just sign you right up here and you'll be on the radio in the next two months. <laughs> <laughs> well, unless you could just... Unless you could be in a time machine and come to nowadays and then be a big TikTok guy. Right. Then you could right. do that. <laughs> yeah. If you've got 5 million followers on TikTok, you can probably... For sure. You can open the show because it's all about your socials now. It's got nothing to do with quality of songs or quality of musicianship. It's just got to do with yeah. who you can reach. A lot of those guys have never done a gig. Yeah. And they're right away... Yeah. 15,000 people. Yeah. You know, I mean, and there's a... I'm sure they're prepared somewhat for it by their label, but yeah. Back to your situation. Yeah. You said something the other day. You were, we were just talking. We drove on Music Row for, yeah. for a brief moment the other night, and um, we played a gig down there, and that was a lot of fun, which we'll, maybe we'll talk a little bit about that later. But yeah. um, we drove past where the Country Music Hall of Fame used, used to be, which yeah. is where now the BMI building is. Yeah. Um, the the Country Music Hall of Fame in Nashville, if you've ever seen it, it's currently, you know, the one you go to is down there off of Demumbrian, and it's it's downtown next to Bridgestone Arena. So it, that current one was built around the year 2000. In the 90s, 80s, all the way back to, I think, 1968, there was one built. The original Country Music Hall of Fame was built right there on Music Row, where right next to what we now call the naked statue that's yeah. <laughs> that, that's what we got now there but uh so there's even a brick wall that was a part of the old parking in that area there there was a story you told about going to the hall of fame yeah. and a story around that could you tell that yeah we i had a recording session booked in the afternoon and didn't know didn't know much about the session other than where i had to be it, it was in doug stone's publishing Okay. Uh, building and it was in the the basement studio, so I knew where I had to be at what time. But I had time for me and some family members to go to the Hall of Fame, and I came across this exhibit of Buddy Emmons, who, at that time, you know, and probably still, there's, you, you know, him and and maybe one or two others are considered the pioneers and legends of the pedal steel guitar. And I'm looking at this incredible exhibit and admiring, you know, it has some of his outfits and some of his old Emmons uh, steel guitars that he had created. And, yeah. And I'm fascinated by historical things. And within an hour of me leaving the Hall of Fame, I go into my studio session and there's Buddy Emmons playing on my sides. <laughs> and it, it was incredibly freaky for me to see and, and to get to talk to. And they're all, all those studio cats are nice guys. Like they're, I mean, they're there to just kind of do their job. They don't get too involved with me as the artist, but just to shake their hand and say I, I'm thrilled to, that you're here and yeah it was it was very very uh for a small town boy to to come to Nashville and record and then to know that you've got hall of fame members you literally just saw their exhibit and then all of a sudden he's playing on my on my music it was just incredible those are the things that I I still just love about this city I mean I I've run into that where I I book a session and I don't know who's playing on it. And then here comes Charlie McCoy toting a bass in there. And I'm just like, what? He, 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 dude, yeah. he's a legend. And then, and then those guys, they... What amazed me about my experience with Charlie McCoy, and I think a lot of them are like this from what I hear, they don't come in there and go, well, this is just some schmuck yeah. songwriter guy, yeah. you know? And then the next day, oh, this is Vince Gill. It's way different. They approach each session with the same professionalism, no matter who that. it's yeah. for. Yeah. And I think that is ama- that's just an amazing thing. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I remember one time on one of my recordings, I recognized the name from the guy who played on almost all of Garth Brooks songs, and he's a violin player named Rob Hajekos. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I, I said, Rob, would it be okay if I just kind of sat in the tracking room just to watch you play like uh, I just want to experience it because he was doing overdubs so the rest of the band had already laid down the beds and he was in there doing dubs and uh, he goes yeah man come on in so I sat over beside him and and I said it I said what was it like recording on all those Garth Brooks tunes and 
And he said, well, I didn't record on all of them. And I, and I, I thought, I'm pretty sure you did. Like, I didn't want to challenge him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then he reminded me that that song that, that Garth did that was uh, 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 Colin Baton Rouge yeah. was originally... Uh, done by John Cowan's band, the, those uh, the new grass, grass. yeah, Newgrass new grass revival. revival, and so it was Sam Bush that actually played right, yeah, the fiddle part on the original and also on the Garth track, right. So it was, it's funny having yourself corrected by the actual people. <laughs> that's right, yeah. Right? <laughs> so uh, it's you know that's one of them things where you might think you know all the trivia. But the real dude is the one telling yeah. you, no, you forgot about that one. Yeah, well, you know, and Bill Monroe had thoughts on that, too. Oh, that new grass bunch, boy, they just plumb went bluegrass, and then they hooked up with that big rock and roll country star. It, it was a daggum shame. You know, they went in there, acted like they was playing bluegrass. It just, it, oh, no, that was plumb pitiful. Yeah, yeah. So that's what Bill thought. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny. And I remember that, uh, and, and John Cowan is still to this day one of my favorite oh, yeah. vocalists. And so that Newgrass version was always kind of in my head as the better version because it was even done a tone higher oh, than okay. it was done in the key of E yeah, instead I got of the key of D. But, uh, yeah, so, I mean, all of that recording process was, was a real thrill for me. And the business side of it, I didn't know anything about the business side of Nashville, and that's where I kind of dropped the ball, where I, 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 I didn't listen enough. I should have just shut up and... When, when the people that are kind of running the career and running the, the album, when they're the ones saying, this is how we want to do it, I think when you're that age, young guy like me, I should have just said, yeah, can't wait. What do I need to do? What did they want to do that you weren't into? Can you talk about that? Yeah, it's more the, the like there was a visual thing, like they wanted me to be a hat, cowboy hat guy, and I wasn't at all. I wasn't, uh, like I say, I was kind of patterning myself after... The, the Vince type of country music as opposed to uh, yeah. all the hot guys that were out there right now which you know we kind of mentioned it was the, the Daryl Singletary and, and Clint Black and Garth and Alan Jackson and right. and I mean Travis Tripp wasn't a hat act but he wasn't also what I was he was more of a, an R&B soul country singer from Georgia yeah so it, you know I, I felt like I want to have my own identity yeah in, in this Nashville recording scene but I didn't have enough leverage to, to say that or yeah. to do that. And nobody, nobody gave me that information saying, just, just be quiet and let the label do what they need to do. So I started to fight back and, and probably wasn't the smartest thing for me to do. And they lost a lot of interest in even promoting the record. And so now when I, when I do shows all across North America, I make the joke that, you know, how many people bought my CD in Nashville in the 90s. I already know that there's no hand that's going to go up because <laughs> I know how many units I sold and it's like if I'm a million seller it's only because I got a million of my stuff in the cellar that's it <laughs> right right that's I, a good I know that nobody bought nobody bought my record I want that record though I, how do I get that record yeah we're going to have to dig through the archives yeah I want to get in that cellar and, and, and drop you about a $20 <laughs> bill <laughs> well I'll take your money son <laughs> yeah uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, it you know, am I thankful for the experience? I really am. Like I felt like I had my kick at the can. In my 35 years of being in this business, I've had a lot of people say, "How come you're not on the radio?" But I had my shot. Like I had my, I was in Nashville. I had the, uh, I'm getting to record with the best of the best, and I don't feel bitter about that. Like I, I feel like that's maybe cool. that's what I should have done. Is I got to do that, but then that meant that maybe my identity was going to be something different. So me going back to Canada after losing the deal, not selling really any units at all, and then having to rediscover myself and revalidate myself as a musician, I realized I needed to work harder as a player and as a, a singer. Uh, I wasn't going to concentrate as much as being a writer as an original artist but I could get better and yeah. so I still wanted to make my living in music and and what I discovered is that you couldn't work enough as as Elvis that's kind of what we we call him like the front guy right I couldn't make enough money doing gigs as Elvis which meant I had to start being a side guy and improving my skills as a side guy so now 
I was going to be everything. I could be hired out as a drummer who sings harmony, mm. as a bass player who sings harmony. Then I started working on the violin, learning how to play that. I started working on my guitar skills so that I could be a better guitar player, that maybe I can get a gig as a guitar player who sings either lead or harmony. And, and a, lot of, a lot of bands took me up on that because I was a good harmony singer. I know that there was always better drummers and bass players, and guitar players and violin yeah. players than me. But not all of them were as good a harmony singer as I was. So I knew, okay, between my own gigs as a singer and side guy gigs, maybe I can make a living at this. And that's kind of how I've been able to to keep to keep plowing through all the the highs and lows of being in in the music business is as as a little bit of everything to wear a bunch of different hats. One thing that is your as you're describing all the side guy stuff you've done. Yeah. Do you feel like it? I mean, you started out as a side guy sure, yeah, yeah. way back years yeah, ago. As a drummer, yeah. As a drummer. So you seem to be, and, and I've worked with you now a little bit, and I, I can say just no ego. There's no, you're team player, easy to work with. And, you know, artists are not often that. Right. And lead front men often are not that. And I'm not trying to generalize, but sure. you know, sometimes that's the case. So, when you come from being a side man in so many situations, do you feel like that gave you a much higher level of empathy for yeah. the people you worked with when you hired them? Yeah. To know what they need to make this a good gig, or to just help, you know, did that help you? I, I think that's As a, a very, front man. that's a very good observation because I think I think I had to to learn how to be everything and that's what teaches you how to be everything yeah. and and when you when you learn and and it's like that even with with validation so because i had to learn how to be a drummer in in a band again and and be a side guy or as a bass player or as whatever you're all it's all about support Mm-hmm. You're going to do something that's going to make that show as good as it can be or make Elvis in the front sound even better. Yeah. It makes you appreciate that when I'm the one in the middle, that somebody is also doing that. Yeah. And it, it, that, that ends up coming across where now all the, the musicians seem to want to work with me because yeah. I, know, I know how to treat them or I at least appreciate and validate their contribution to this project. Yeah. So that's why I've got I've got a lot of guys that have kept with me for 15 years. Right. Yeah. In in band scenarios and if I've got a new project a lot of those guys say, "Well, I want in on it." Like I'll yeah. if I if I can be your your guy, I'd like to be your guy. So I hope that my my role as a side guy made me a better front guy. I'm hoping. Yeah. There's a I listen to this guy Colin Cowherd. Yeah, sports yeah. I, I love his takes and, yeah. and I like his uh, his musings, the things he talks about. One of one of the things I've heard him say a bunch, and it got me to thinking years ago, he'd say, you know, lubricate the room, don't agitate the room. Yeah. So in sports you get these guys in the locker room and they're agitators. Yeah. And then you get some that are lubricators for the team. And um you know, and there's all kinds of examples of that throughout sports history, and 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 I thought of that in a band sense where there's I look back on it, there's been times where oh I wasn't very lubricating in that right. situation I was more of an agitator I need to be and so that that started making me think more right. lubricate and so I notice that now when I'm around people and you come into room you lubricate room you make it work you 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 identify oh, I could do this or I could contribute this. And I can say that because this weekend we're working on a project and it, you know, we've never really worked together. Right. And we've got several musicians, all of us gathered here. Asa's one of them. Asa, you're the same way. You can come into a room, lubricate the room. And I think just that quality, I, I was thinking that that had to have come from just years of experience of being a side man having to do that to survive to make it and then adapting you know you're just you seem very adapt adaptable and what is it, pliable that's yeah, another word yeah, yeah. all these words and i just admire the heck out of that because i i'm recognizing 
just in my life the need to get more that way as time goes on and so when i see that in somebody i'm just like oh dude how did you how'd you figure that out right and uh, i want it's like i'm gonna sit at your feet and um so yeah now i guess i've taken it in a more i keep taking it to a psychological that's okay direction but i want to go back now to what you were talking about you were you, so you went back to canada what did any part of you want to just stay in nashville and just kind of figure it out or were you like you know what i think i can what made you go back i think that maybe my life as a as an athlete i was a pass or fail person okay so if you if you don't win the gold medal game then you failed and and i know that sounds extreme no and and maybe not maybe not the most uh politically correct way of looking at things but that's the way i grew up is that if you're not the champion, then you, you're you lost. Right. First place or second place is first loser. <laughs> yeah. So for me to have kind of lost the the, the deal, uh, the label is no longer interested in, in me. And I'm not the you know this, that happens thousands of times in Nashville where they something they try something and it doesn't work and sometimes people come back. There's lots of people who Garth is one of them. He he was told. They weren't interested in him whatsoever. Taylor Swift, they weren't interested the first time. She, they, yeah. There's a lot of people that became very successful by they kept banging on the door. Right. I, I wasn't like that. For me, it was more like I've got to find my own identity in this business. So the first thing I did was I'm going to get better as a musician. I'm going to get better as an overall player so that I can keep working. Simultaneous to that, I had an agency contact me from Hamilton, Ontario. And he said, have you ever thought of doing tribute work? And I didn't know what it was. And he said, there's very few people that I know that can sing as high as Roy Orbison. Have you ever heard of Roy Orbison? I said, well, I've only ever heard of the song Crying and Oh Pretty Woman. Those are the only ones that I had ever heard of. Yeah. And he said, I want you to just look at his catalog of music. Like he's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but he's a big deal. But because I grew up on country music, I didn't grow up on rock and roll at all. So he was oblivious to me. But this guy, this agent said, just check him out and and see if it's something that you think you could do. Well, his catalog of music is is pretty awesome. It is. Like he had some some really great songs that were done differently than everybody else was doing them. He'd have split bars of like where the time signatures were not normal. And I thought, how cool is that? And as a drummer, I thought, this is even cooler. Yeah. Because it, I found his music interesting because it wasn't so uh, formulaic. And it, he had kind of some darkness in his, in his repertoire and in his life. Like a bunch of family members had passed away. And, yeah. And it's like he had this gloom. But his gloom came out in music. And although a person might tear up, it still was inspirational. Very much so, yeah. That so, was my first CD, by the way, Roy yeah? Orbison. Oh yeah, no, goodness. I was, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm a massive fan, so I'm <laughs> right there with you. I, I ended up telling this agent after a week or so of listening to all the catalog of hits, I said, yeah, if you can book me doing an Orbison show, I'm in. And <clears throat> so that was the start of it for me doing tribute work. And wow. that's kind of been the, the bulk of my work ever since then. So that'd be since the late 90s. Really? into 2000 wow. has been doing tribute work to from Roy Orbison to um, then I, I, I was in a band where it was in the Eagles so I was a drummer in an Eagles yeah. tribute band and I loved that lots of great harmonies great songs like historic songs songs yeah. that will never go away um, and then there was all of a sudden some agents were saying we, we need somebody to do Zach Brown band because he was hot Right, yeah. and and I I had kind of heard a few of his songs because I I didn't really listen to country radio. I haven't since. Yeah, but um, again, his music was different. It was That's a good. different. I was hearing major seventh chords in in yeah. in a country music band, right? Which you don't really hear that in new country music. Not now. Yeah. So I thought, okay, I gotta check this Zach Brown guy out and and love this music. They they had rock and roll influences in their in their band, like like a jam band. Yeah, like all of a sudden it was like the Grateful Dead or the Allman Brothers. Like some of their their live versions were very exciting to me. So we put together a very successful Zach Brown tribute 
played all across North America, done great, great. We were playing for 10,000 people, right? So oh gosh, if, wow. you can't, if you can't afford the 300 or $500 to go see Zach Brown, you can go see me for 50 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do a great job, I know. We, uh, I remember we, in some of our travels, we'd, we'd run into their musicians in airports. Oh, what was that they like? They would get such a kick out of, like, I don't, I don't like attention at all, uh, especially off stage. Like, I, I really yeah. don't, I'm, I don't, I'm not really good in that. But the guys in the band said, uh, there's somebody from Zach's band over here wants to meet you. And he wants you to put, <laughs> put your Zach Brown hat on, because like, you know, when he stopped wearing those little beanies, he would wear these cool hats. Zach Brown had all these cool hats, so I was getting all these cool hats <laughs> so that I could really identify as Zach Brown. And I'm going to give you one quick story in a second. But so I go over and meet, and it's Danny. He's the percussionist that's been with him for a number of years, and uh, he was on the way to go play with Zach, and we were on the way somewhere to go to a Zach Brown show. <laughs> So now we're sitting talking to a guy who's actually in the band, and he says, how many songs do you guys do? And I said, well, usually in a night we'll do at least 18. And Zach and he says, that's more than we do. <laughs> because they're always doing covers. Like, they'll throw in... Because he said, Zach... No way. He said, Zach's got music ADHD, where he'll... He's got hits, and everybody wants to kind of hear the hits, especially from the early records. Yeah. But instead, he'll go on another, another tangent, and he'll be doing other stuff Metallica and he'll be doing anything, <laughs> anything anything but his own music yeah and Danny was joking about how how funny it is that a, a tribute band is doing more real Zach Brown songs than the real Zach Brown that is great. in a Zach Brown concert so <laughs> but I'll give you this story because it's 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 self humiliating for sure I had a show in Penticton British Columbia and then but it, it was an individual show like it was just me as at a festival and I had to catch a plane from Vancouver and the next day I had to do a show in Connecticut and it was a Whoa. it was a Zach Brown tribute show but we were the we were the outdoor show for the the Kenny Chesney concert so we were going to entertain the thousands of people that are wow that are in a couple hours are going to go in to see Kenny Chesney so they wanted to put on they called it a rooftop concert so all the parkades and everything, they set up this massive, like as big as the show is inside, they did this outside. <laughs> but the Zach Brown singer is me, and I'm trying to get from all the way of Western Canada. So just think, just a little bit north of Seattle. Yeah. I've got to get there. Overnight, I got to get to Connecticut. Good. To do this show. So. At some point during the, like, when you switch planes and you catch another connecting flight, I, I could see that I was going to be pretty short on time. I literally had an Uber reserved to pick me up at, at uh, an airport in Connecticut, and it was a 90-minute drive to get, and I would have to pull in to the back of the stage area and go, I had 20 minutes. Wow. That's the window of time that I had. So I'm at this other airport. I think I was in Raleigh, was my connecting flight. Yeah. Which is your neck of the woods. Yeah. So I'm in Raleigh. I decided that I should get on my Zach Brown clothes, which is fake tattoos and uh, uh, one of his kind of hipster hats that he wears. And I'm fully Zach Brown now. <laughs> Not because I want attention, but right. because I don't have time. Yeah. I'm literally going to get off this next plane into an Uber and on stage. You don't want attention. I don't I know want that attention. about you. Yeah, exactly. Right. So I can see in the gateway of the departure of the terminal, and I'm carrying a like a, a guitar case that like it's a road case, it's got stickers on it, whatever. And I I'm grumpy because I'm watching the clock. Now this flight leaving is already 15 minutes behind. Oh no. We've been delayed 15 minutes. You know how you read the screen and I'm like, oh, so I'm starting to get a little bit grumpy. Well, this guy comes up with his two little kids and he says, uh, excuse me, sir. And he was beautiful. It, he wasn't inappropriate. He said, is there, is there any chance that you're a, a, a musician? And I said, yep. And I said it like that, right, like yeah. real cold, like yeah. not not so affectionate. No. Uh, and he goes, do, "Do you mind me asking what kind of music you play?" And without thinking of it, I said, "Have you ever heard of the Zach Brown Band?" 
well, that was it. I couldn't even get, because I wanted to say, we do a trip. I couldn't say it because the screaming started. No. He started, his kids go, I knew it. I knew you were Zach Brown. I knew it. I thought he was taller. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just threw that in. Okay. But anyways, the kids are freaking out. So now everybody in the departure terminal is coming over because no. it's a scene now, right? So I'm trying to think, how do I get myself out of this nonsense that I got myself into? Because I'm not trying to be Zach Brown. No. I'm only dressed up like that because I have to be on stage in a couple hours. It's so Seinfeld, this whole thing. So, Very Seinfeld, yeah. yeah. So it ends up where, at some point, I just owned it. Right? At some point, I thought, I just have to go with it. Because I can't explain. Oh, yeah. Now there's 25 people who are all trying to take pictures. There was Asians. No. Who couldn't speak English. But they knew that I was a celebrity because everybody was making they a got scene. Their cameras. So now the cameras are all out and I'm posing with these little Japanese women. Perfect. I looked like I looked like I was tall, like Zach Brown. Yeah, that's great. Next to the Asians. <laughs> <laughs> but I owned it. I was telling the kids, eat your eat your vitamins, say your prayers. Like I was. <laughs> hey, a little bit of chicken fried. Yeah, a little yeah. bit of chicken fried. So, anyways, I had to stop being grumpy and I had to be. Welcoming to, yeah. to all of this. I mean, you're gonna you gotta make Zach Brown look good <laughs> at this point. <laughs> so it was, uh, the, and it's funny that people do come up at tribute concerts and they'll say, like, I have all your albums and and do they really? They, they think they saw. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because oh. we do a good show. Like the band is good and and because they're big shows. But when you've got thousands of people, you might assume that, okay, well I only know that one song, Chicken Fried, but that must be the band. That's amazing! Wow. Yeah. So, first of all, have you ever met Zach Brown? No. 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 Okay, I really want that to happen. So the, yeah, I, I don't know if <laughs> I if want the, you to tell him that. I story. don't know if those artists are offended. I at, doubt at the it. fact that we do tribute work, but I mean, I will say, especially in places like Eastern Canada, like I did a tour last year with the guys, and we played twenty, twenty-three shows. In um, in a month of Zach Brown shows in the maritime provinces of Canada, and I can guarantee you that eighty percent of the people in every audience would not know more than one, maybe two Zach Brown band songs. So when they come away from that show and they say, "I never knew that he had such great songs," I realize that we're actually we're not hindering the Zach Brown band. We're actually making them more popular because. There's a whole big audience out there that has only heard the big radio hits, right? right? Whereas some of his more uh, meaningful songs, like not the the radio kind of poppy, yeah, s- shiny stuff. Some of his best material is the stuff that people haven't heard yet, and that's the we do the, a lot of that. Yeah, that's um, so cool. So yeah, so I, I've often thought justified like. I'm not doing any disservice to the Zach Brown man. If anything, I'm opening up people that would have never heard of him before. Yeah. So uh, I don't feel guilty. No, you shouldn't. Well, I, you you went from. Tell me how the creative side of you goes into doing these shows, tribute shows, and how do you manage that creative? Do you? I mean, help me. And I can speak from experience little sliver of experience yeah. tiny compared to what you've done I just did that Johnny Cash thing yeah 70 days it I felt I started feeling like well hold on well and part of it was I was working for another company so they own the show so I, I really just have to do what they say to do and right. and that sounds kind of easier than what I normally do and it, it technically is but the mental toll it took on me was I'm going out and I'm saying things I don't believe in, singing things I don't really care about. You know, I'm singing album cuts that I would never do. I think this is a bad song to do in this show, but I'm doing it. Of course, you're you're in control of those situations, so you can weed those out. But the creative part of me was struggling with this good business decision. Mm-hmm. And so, how have you managed that? Because I know you're a creative soul, and you. One of my favorite things to li- I, I've noticed is you talk about every tribute act opportunity that you were getting. You would dive into the music, and you had a true respect and authentic love for the music and the musicianship, 
and you didn't just go, well, the people don't know the difference. I'll just play right. uh, the song this way. We don't need to play all them chords. Yeah, I've seen that in yeah. tribute bands where, yeah. oh, well, we don't know how to play it, but we'll just kind of do it. Yeah, because. And that gives, it, yeah. So yeah. I've, but you aren't that way. You are, you are a perfectionist in that sense, from what I can tell. Yeah. So, long, overarching question: How did how do you manage that creative part? You said something the other day, and I hope you say it again because yeah. it's really good. No, I think that you know, at one time in my life, my career was creating music, and then when I when I started becoming a tribute artist, I realized I had to recreate music. That's and good. so it, yeah. it it became a way for me to put myself in as the character and be authentic and integral towards the music, but to make sure that it is the standard that I would have expected to do even if it was my own music. Yeah. And, and that way, because not everybody recreates music to the same level. Yeah. If I have to recreate a catalog of hits by an artist, let me exemplify it. And I'm going to shift gears because I remember I was in Florida doing Zach Brown shows. Again, an agent contacts me and says, is there any chance that you can sing Billy Joel? And all of these have the same catalyst. My answer is always, I've heard a couple songs. <laughs> Right, like it's not like I was ever a, a, a fan of the artist that I end up portraying. But I said to the Asian, I said, uh, "I've heard Piano Man, and you may be right." Was you know something that we had played in the club scenes, and and I said, "I don't know anything about the guy." Right. And he said, "Well, he's harder to sing than what people think. Like he's a he's a pop pop singer, but it, the music's a little more complicated." And, and we'd like to hire you to do some shows. Like we have a string of shows, much like what you were asked to do for the Johnny Cash show. We've got them already lined up, mm -hmm. but you're the guy who we think we can do it. And I said, well, when do the shows start? And they said, May. And this was in, it was three months prior. Wow. Okay. And I said, uh, I said, well, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, I, I can't do it. And he said, well, why not? I said, because I don't play piano. And he said, I thought you played every instrument. I said, that's the one instrument I never learned in my whole life. I play every other instrument. I think I, I, th I play 10 instruments, but I don't play piano. And he said, you don't need to. He says, we'll pre-record the piano parts and you can just sit up there and pretend. And I said, there is zero chance that I will ever pretend to do anything on stage. Right. I'm just, I'm not your guy. Integrity, I love it. And he said, well, what what if you just learned what you could do? I <laughs> know <laughs> you know where this is going. I said, "Well, what do you mean?" And he said, "Well, this is how much it pays." And I said, "I'll learn the yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll learn Sorry. the dad gum piano." <laughs> there you go. So, anyways, there I am in Florida. I realized I had sixteen Billy Joel songs that I was going to learn the piano parts from back to front. In three months. So I actually calculated how many hours a day and how many days a week I would have to spend on piano. And I would start on the first song of the set list and just every week I would have to be at a certain progress line. And that's where the athlete comes in. Yeah. Right? Because I don't think most musicians would have that much fortitude mm -hmm. or stubbornness, whatever you want to call it. But... I can go do I, I do I go do Billy Joel show, shows <laughs> I know you by do. myself on piano and obviously I mean he, he was playing piano from when he was four years old yeah so I'm not I can't play everything that he does but I can play every song well enough and with the correct voicings and chord changes and so that no one would ever say that I'm not doing justice to the Billy Joel music I will continue to get better I will continue to get better at that one solo that is he plays a little quicker than what I do. So I won't play 16th notes. I'll play a couple eighth notes in there because I'm just not quick enough. But one day I'll be able to because I keep working at it. Yeah. But that's that's kind of what, when I say I recreate music now, but I do it with integrity. I would never be like that guy because I personally know people that fake it. Yeah. 
they go up there and they fake the piano to play Billy Joel or they fake the piano to play Elton John and I can't do that. If all the if all the power went out and there was just a grand piano, I would still be able to do a whole heap of Billy Joel songs. They might not sound right without all the instruments, right? Because a lot of his stuff's pretty rocking. We didn't start the fire. That wouldn't sound that good with just a piano. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that I, you know, all those lovely piano ballads, I can play those no problem. Man, that is incredible. That, so that, three months. Yeah, three months. Three months I learned how to play a Billy Joel show on piano, and that's that's not right. Like, I would need to be hospitalized if I asked myself to do that again. You did it, though. And what I love about it, it's that it's that thing you said earlier where you're in competition with yourself. Yeah. And that's the best person to be in competition with because mm-hmm. you don't get into the comparison game. Yeah. You're not worried about what others are doing or trying to get – you're just, I'm going to be the best me I can be. Yeah. And then these little things come along and they're challenges, and that – that makes me feel alive when I have a challenge like that that I yeah. and a mark yeah. like sports yeah. and that, that's really cool that you you did that and so now how what's your of all the shows you're doing yeah. like what's the most which the ones getting booked the most is there one or they just all the all of them there, there there's probably three now that are 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 the most commonly booked the Billy Joel show seems to be gaining more and more momentum because I think he's kind of come back yeah. in popularity. Madison Square Garden, all that <clears throat> yeah. stuff going on. Yeah. The, uh, the Zach Brown show, I would say his popularity decreases every year. So last year, if I did 20, 25 shows of Zach Brown, this year it would be 20, 15 to 20. Really? Okay. Only because his radio awareness is gone. Right, okay. Yeah. He's just not on the radio anymore. And it's because he doesn't fit the new the new country thing at all. Like he's right. He's kind of an old dog now. Uh, and I'm okay with that because I'll just I'll just do the ones that that get booked, you know. So Billy Joel gets booked and we've been doing an Alabama show. Um and and especially now we we lost Jeff Cook a, f- a few years ago. Um, from the original Alabama band he yeah. passed on so they, they probably won't be touring as much which means the tribute acts start getting booked a little bit more and there's there's a band from Fort Payne, Alabama that does a tribute to them called Boys in the Band and they're very good Yeah. Um, but I think we're good too Like we're, we're from up in Canada and, and we go out as a four piece or as a five piece if there's a budget there we bring in a fiddle player, but if there isn't a budget, I play the fiddle parts. You do, yeah. Oh. So <laughs> it it uh, we you know the people still get to hear the fiddle stuff. And if you're going to play in Texas, you got to have fiddle in the band yeah. and mountain music and Dixieland delight and all that. But and and it it freaks people out when the singer all of a sudden grabs the violin and starts playing those endings. Yeah. Um, and it's the same in the Billy Joel show that if the budget isn't there, I'll do. Uh, some of those big songs that had tenor saxophone all play those parts oh, on saxophone man. and and it's I have this line I know you like humor in shows so you yeah I love it I'll give you my line just before we're about to do the song New York State of Mind which has a legendary saxophone solo in it uh, I'm sitting at the piano and I've always got two saxophones behind me and I always use the same joke. I say to the audience that our saxophone player got arrested yesterday <laughs> with unpaid parking tickets. And I usually name the city that we're in. Yeah. Right? <laughs> uh, and I said, we, we, we couldn't bail him out in time because his court date isn't until tomorrow morning. Is there anybody in this audience that knows how to play one of these things here? Yeah. And I point, the spotlight shows over to the, these saxophones. And I've only ever had one guy said, well, I can play sax. And I'm thinking, oh, oh no. you're, you're ruining my bit. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> but nobody's ever had the courage to come up on stage and play the horn. Thank God. Right. Yeah. So it's already it's already mic'd up. Like it's got a, a wireless mic. It's ready to go. So I do the you know, first verse and then the bridge, and then all of a sudden it's the, it's the sax solo, and I literally spin Whoa. my stool around, grab the tenor saxophone, and play the solo. Ugh. And they literally, they, they that, go, that probably gets they go the nuts. biggest applause of the night. Yeah. Because you don't expect short, chunky Billy Joel to turn around and start playing the, the saxophone. No, the, 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 the jig is up because it's, it's already over, it's exposed. 
but through the rest of the night, I probably play another three or four mm. solos. Man, that, that's gotta uh, be so satisfying. It's entertaining. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, I, and I think that because we as a band play it pretty well, like we play that show pretty well, um, and and if I'm in good voice, I can execute it vocally, and because we have kind of those little funny things. I think that's why that show is getting booked more and more all the time. It's because it, it's it's entertaining. Yeah, and it's yeah, the it's most awesome. show like me. Because Billy Joel is, I mean, he's late 70s. Two hips have been replaced. He's had multiple failed marriages. This is my life. <laughs> <laughs> right? So I'm the perfect guy. He's short. Oh, he's chunky. No. He's bald. <laughs> and he's got a goatee. Like, you can't get... You know, I never had Christy Brinkley, but darn close. <laughs> and I love that it all started from a phone call from an Asian guy. Yeah. And you had no no intention of doing it. it no, just... no inclination to that at all. Because, But I think because it didn't work for me in Nashville, it was going to be a new identity where, and I like it. I like it because nobody even knows who I am. Yeah. Like, you literally, I've had people in tears in an autograph line saying I've you know I've seen Billy Joel and you recreate that music or I've seen Zach Brown and you made me feel like I was there like that nostalgia is why I do it but it's nice I get that that um, reward but then I get to go home and just be me right because I don't have the pressure of trying to sell units or trying to put bums in the seats that's yeah. not my job I'm not the promoter it's not my career. Wow. I'm just providing the service. Man, and I I can relate with you that nobody knows who I am either. It's <laughs> fat, it's yeah. <laughs> I, I I came 3000 miles to see you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah but it doesn't seem to be working out as good for me. Like, <laughs> but oh man, that's so great. Man. Yeah. So uh, we before we wrap this, yeah. there was something you you mentioned the possibility of talking about a vocal thing that changed you said something earlier in the yeah. pod about a vocal thing well i hate to open because i don't i don't really like all this self um whatever um glo glory but at one point while in in the midst of all my tribute work i saw a television commercial looking for canada's next opera star oh yeah I gotta so i'm this. i'm a i'm a little i'm a little guy from a little town in bc I didn't know what opera was. I grew up on Comedy Twitty. So I had no idea. The commercial was saying we're looking for Canada's next opera star. I had seen the Broadway show Phantom of the Opera in Toronto. Yeah. So I thought, I think I could probably sing that. Like it's it's high voiced. Yeah. And it's it's big. And I had those characteristics. So I sent in my 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 uh, demo C D to apply for the show. And they wrote me back and they said, uh, uh, Mr. Lammy, is there any chance that you have anything operatic? Because this is country music. And I emailed back and I said, oh, no, I, I'm a country singer. <laughs> <laughs> so I can imagine what the producers of the TV show are thinking as they're getting this, right? Yeah. This guy is as hillbilly as, he, hillbilly as it gets. Yeah. He has no idea. Let's invite him on to the show. This would be good television. It's good television compelling mm -hmm. uh, so I get this phone call is there any chance that you can drive to Toronto to the University of Toronto Hart House Theatre and we'll have live auditions on camera yep I can sing Phantom of the Opera you need to bring piano music well the only sheet music that I had piano was Wind Beneath My Wings by Bette Midler <laughs> Okay. Which is every opera singer's got that in their catalog. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I show up with my sheet music of Bette Midler to a theater, and I walk in. I walk in the the lobby, and I can hear people singing in foreign languages, and I can hear they're dressed in gowns and tuxedos, and I'm like, "What's well, the wrong place?" Like that's not that's not Phantom of the Opera. So I walked up to a guy with one of the walkie-talkie things, and I said, "Is there other sections of this theater?" And he goes, uh, I don't, he says, I'm here with a TV company. I have no idea. What do you need? And I said, well, I'm supposed to audition, but this isn't, it's not this. And he goes, uh, what's your name? And I gave him my name. He goes, oh, yeah, you're up in 20 minutes. 
I said, doing this? And he said, hey man, I just work here. So I said, okay, well, he said, I'm going to get somebody to come talk to you. So a guy from the TV show comes over and he says, you're Elton Lammy? And I said, yeah. And he says, yeah, you're going to audition in that theater. So before you go in, the cameras will be on you. We're going to ask you some questions. We'll take you into the green room and then you'll be on. 20 minutes. Sign all these documents. Signing away your life and your privileges yeah. and your rights and your imagery and everything else is now owned by this. Because essentially it's an American Idol show yeah. for opera singers. And I'm, I'm literally there in cowboy boots, blue jeans, and a, like it looked like a curtain that my grandmother, a crushed velvet shirt. Because <laughs> I think I'm going to sing just like some Broadway tunes or whatever. Yeah. And uh, that's how naive I am sometimes in life. But that's, that's how this all started. And this 2005 or 2006... TV cameras come over and say, so we're going to roll here now, so if you don't mind just answering any questions that come your way, don't look at the cameras, just answer the questions. So we're walking towards the green room, we get into behind the stage, and they're going, so uh, are you a trained opera singer? And I'm like, no, no. I said, they said, so you've never heard of Pavarotti? And I said, no, but I've eaten Panzerotti. <laughs> right? Because my whole go-to when it comes to me being in an uncomfortable situation, it's always humor. Yeah. I can always charm or humor my way almost out of anything. Yeah. So now I'm devastated inside because I'm in the wrong place. Like, this, I don't belong here. Uh-huh. But I can be funny. Right. So at least on national television, people will say, yeah, he was funny. Because they, they, people like funny. People like funny. They're going to like you. Especially when you're in an uncomfortable situation. Right. So I'm making joke after joke. I can see the guys with their cameras on their shoulders laughing. Yeah. Because I'm telling jokes. So all the singers that we've had backstage here today, they've been doing their vocal warm-ups. What do you do? And I said, oh, I'm a country singer. I said, to warm up, we drink bourbon. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like it was one zinger after another. Right. And uh, they're loving it. I can now hear... The guy playing piano out on stage, struggling with this pop song because it's not classical music. He has no idea how that how that melody line should flow oh, because man. he's never listened to it. Mm. So and he's I, reading it, but I, he's not. Right. I soon learned that classical music people are only devoted to classical music. They don't ever strive. Wow. So now I'm thinking, he doesn't even know how to play When Beneath My Wings. And... I get out there and I sang for maybe 15 seconds. And I can hear in the darkness of the theater, I can hear laughter. So now I'm, my athlete is coming out. Because now I'm not liking that people are laughing at me. Right. So one voice, there's a string of judges, says, uh, so Mr. Lammy, you didn't know what you were getting yourself into today. And I said, no idea. I honestly thought, the phantom of the opera. Like I thought it was something like that, right? Yeah. And I thought, maybe I could do that. And he goes, well, since you drove all the way to Toronto, uh, do you mind if I just come up on stage? And at the piano, I'm just going to try some things with your voice. I said, yeah, 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 come on up. At this point, I'm so shook up by this experience that I don't even remember the next 15 minutes. But apparently for 15 minutes, he just said, I'm going to play this, and I want you to sing it. So I did that. Now, 15 minutes later, they excused me. I drove the two hours home thinking that I just embarrassed myself on national TV because mm. I thought about on American Idol, the first episode or two ep first two episodes are usually a bunch of people who think that they're good and don't belong there. Yeah. That's me <laughs> in this contest. Like, I was that guy that they used to make television. Right. Because I kind of made an idiot of myself. I wanted to put it behind me and just continue on with my regular career. Maybe six weeks later, they went coast to coast. From the east coast of Canada, even up into the Northwest Territories, they did auditions. Wow. And then I get a phone call at some point, a month and a half later, saying, you're in. <laughs> and my exact words were, what kind of, I won't use the language, but what kind of contest where a guy who's a hillbilly 
gets laughed off the stage. What kind of, and I'm in? And they said, well, I'm, I'm just relaying the information. I'm just a production assistant. I just work here. Yeah. <laughs> Can you come and move to Toronto for as long as we need you? We're going to put you up in like the fancy hotels. and So I'm not going to try and make this as long, elongated, but essentially the first day of filming, filming in Toronto, one of the judges says to me, and he looks like, this is on camera, in front of all of Canada and the U.S., we later found out. Mm. You don't belong here. And I was like, oh, wow. well, and he says, do you even know what the word legato means? And he's like, he's going hard at me. Uh-huh. Like, came in hot. Like, sea biscuit hot. Yeah. And again, athlete, I fought quite a few times in hockey. Right. <laughs> I, thought, I thought you did not need to do that on camera. Yeah. Like if you don't like me being here because I'm not a classically trained singer, you guys voted me on here. Now apparently he was dead set against me being on the show because I'm not classically trained. Right. Every other singer that made it onto the show, their life has been classical music training, lessons every week singing with orchestras like you know and I'm a hillbilly <laughs> singing in country bars I love how you, you talk yourself down man you're you're more than that but, right. uh, but in their world I wasn't he made me so mad by embarrassing me on camera that once the cameras are roll are off we're supposed to go back to our hotel rooms I asked one of those PAs uh, production assistants I said can you take me somewhere to a music store where I can buy some DVDs or something with opera singers so that I can figure out what the heck I'm going to do. And he said, uh, yeah, of course. We're here to serve you. So we drove to some store in Toronto. I bought DVDs of Luciano Pavarotti, of, uh, like Carreras, Domingo, all the big heavyweights. And then I bought CDs so that I could listen to them. And I literally spent all of my not-on-camera time studying and learning and copying what those people didn't realize is I make my living imitating people. Yeah. Whoa. I'm a tribute guy. Yeah. If I study how they sing, I might be able to actually not get kicked off this show in the first week. Yeah. Right? And that was my determination. That was my athletic ability all my life being trained to win. Yeah. So that I did not get kicked off the first week. So the first week, I'm there five days, six days, whatever it is. Every day... You get free lessons with real deal professors. Wow. And I'm all over it. Because I'm a blank canvas. I don't know anything about this stuff. Yeah. And sure enough, the first week I didn't get eliminated. And week after week after week, my determination would get stronger. Now I got to perform a song in Italian. Now I got to do a Baroque period. Like every week it was something. Now I got to do a duet that from Mendelssohn, from Felix Mendelssohn. Right, like these are all. It's and the one thing I'll say about this show compared to American Idol is you can't fake this. No, there's no fluff. There's no. I had a great background story because I was a country guy. Right. That's a great story, but you still have to deliver on a Friday yeah. night. Like you can't just show up and your story gets you through to the next round, mm. because the judges, most of them were celebrity, world famous from Vienna, from like it's a big deal. And I also had an advantage over many of these other performers because I've been a performer since I was 18. Right, yeah. On stage with big audiences. None of those people have had that because they're amateurs. They're not pros. I was a pro in a different genre. Uh-huh. But that gave me, like, when, when I had to be the Duke and sing an Italian piece about how... I love women and they're just peasants to me. Well, I I was able to do that in front of these audiences because I'm a performer. Right. And so I would like week after week after week, I would get through. And then the voting of fans started to happen. And I was killing everybody (laughs) because I was the underdog. And, and, And then the last, when you were in the last six people, we got moved to this multi-million dollar mansion in Toronto which is the wealthiest area of the city and now the cameras are on us kind of like Big Brother 
And there were certain people in that top six who hated me because they couldn't believe I was still in the contest right. with no yeah. classical background. But what people didn't know was when that camera was off, I was calling in piano players to come to the house, to that little baby grand, and I would practice and practice and practice, and I would just, I put in way more effort than anybody, because yeah. I didn't want to lose. And the end, the end result, after all of that, is I won the whole thing. Oh! What? Get out! Oh, so, uh, man. Uh, 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 a dad gum hillbilly singer <laughs> won Canada's next opera. You're star. freaking Rocky Balboa, dude. Yeah. And then, as a result of that, I mean, winning the show was unbelievable. But then, I got a bursary, forty thousand dollar bursary, to go study classical music at wow. the University of Toronto, Goodness. and really learn how to use my instrument. Yeah. Right. Of so, two years of schooling. Um, singing opera in Italy Scotland Whoa. like I've been all over the world as an opera singer <laughs> Dude. so I still do that I still do like there are performances and for some people that's the favorite version of me is the guy who shows up in a tuxedo with a guy on a cello a violin player and a piano player and doing the great classical music for a, an opera tenor and then throwing in things from Les Miserables and Phantom and all these great Josh Groban like you know so there are times during the year where that's my gig is Tuxedo Elton can you go from Alabama Elton to Tuxedo Elton in like a day it's easier to go the other way I got you because there's a larynx placement of um, opera singing because I have to sing in opera houses for 2,000 people with no microphone over no mic. an 80-piece orchestra. What? That's yeah. still happening in opera? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's the thing? You, I you can't that. not do that. The Whoa. only only way that you'll ever not... The only way you'll ever use a microphone is if it's being televised. Mm. So it needs to be recorded yeah. to the truck outside. The but tr- other than that... Anywhere I've ever sung opera. I bet no opera singer says it that way, other than you. <laughs> I just got, we got recorded to You're the You're 100% right. <laughs> that's so great, man. So, yeah. So, that that's a part of my life that was hugely fulfilling. Because, again, my determination got me to do something that no one would ever dream could be, could be done. No. And, I mean, some of these opera professionals. So, circle. And then I don't need to talk anymore. That judge that embarrassed me that first day of filming... The guy who said, and he said it like a jerk. Yeah. He said, "You don't belong here." Very condescending, though. Oh. Yeah. And and because I mean I I had studied drums, so I I kind of knew what legato. I had heard that term, but it's not it's not a term that we use in, in the syncopation book in drumming, right? right? So he embarrassed me on purpose. But at the end, when I won, like when when the judges picked me to win. He was the first person that came up, up onto the stage in this gorgeous theater. I'm still in shock. He's got tears in his eyes. Uh. And he embraced me, and he said, I'm so glad you proved me wrong. But he embraced me in a way where, and this is a kind of, a, it's an emotional moment for me, because I hugged him like I normally would hug a person, and he changed the hug. He said, the star is always downstage. What do you mean, Dan? Wow. So my head, he had to change my head placement for the hug to be towards the audience. Oh, I got you. So stars in theater or in opera, classical music, if you go see an opera, the star, if they embrace, is never not seen. So if you and I were to hug, I can't hug you over your right shoulder if the audience is there. That's bad protocol. Oh, I got you. I'm the star. So, so when he when he stopped that. me, whoa, he was like, "You're the star," mm. and he actually made me hug him with my head towards the audience, <laughs> and I was like, "Like that's a huge thing." Yeah, to have a guy who's a professional, he's a director for opera, and and for him to stop my hug and say, "No," over these six and a half months, you proved me wrong. I mean, are you, are you? I'm just sitting here hearing this. And I'm, is there a movie about you somewhere that I don't know about? Like, <laughs> it just going? happened. The other five people are hearing it right now. 
<laughs> wow. Hey, this thing's going to take off. We're going to have at least 40 people. 40, I, okay. I'm hoping. That, no, right. no, hey, Asa, before we cut this off, do you have a question for, that you want me to ask Elton or that you want to ask Elton? Not that, anymore. I learned a lot just now. <laughs> no. You learned a lot. I learned a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you cut. Man, you're such a great storyteller. Thank you. And inspirational so with you. your life. And uh, thank you for sitting down with, with me and doing this. Thanks for having me. It's nice to... Uh, it's nice to be in the company of people that I love and respect like you two. And we've had a great few days together where we've been able to create some things. And, and that's what it's all about. It's yeah. all about um, giving to each other. And I think that's what makes the world a better place. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for doing that. And thank you all for listening. On the cusp, off the cuff, I, I can't even get over what I just heard. I, we'll just, I, don't, I think this is the end of the podcast. I can't get better. We're done. All right. Later.